We're just really thrilled to have Haley Maxwell, our new counselor, and she's going to be speaking with you tonight on, I think, the topic resiliency. Am I saying that right, Haley? Yeah. Yeah, we are. Um, thanks, Michelle. We yeah. are talking about resiliency, um, and this is like a small group. Please stop and ask questions. It's been so fun getting to know all of the teachers, and I love doing carpool. For some reason, it reminds me of summer camp. Um, so I, I'm a morning person and that like really shines just like my special time of day. So I apologize if you are not a morning person and I greet your children in a really chipper manner. It's, um, it's funny how easy it is to spy like the morning children and the not the morning children. Um, but anyways, it's been really fun getting to be a part of this community. So I'm going to share my screen and, um, we'll just go through this and stop me if you have questions, stop me if you want more information, and we'll just kind of go from there. Okay, so we are talking about raising resilient children, and we are going to go over what resiliency is, what are the strategies that make up resiliency, how we build it in ourselves and in our children, and specifically I want to talk about the difference between shame versus guilt and how that impacts um, how we talk to our children, how we talk to our children about our behavior, and it also how um, our children behave based off of those conversations. But before we get started, I think we always underestimate what it feels like to get in your car and listen to whatever music you want and drive to Holy Spirit and walk to the door and greet a friend. Um, with the Zoom world, we never get to do that. So I just wanna take a second and do a little mindful practice with everyone. This is called 478 Breathing. It's um, a really easy mindfulness practice and it's something you could teach your kids, you could teach your teenagers. And what's interesting about it is that our breath and our emotions are super connected. And this type of breathing helps your brain turn kind of from offline back to online. So if it affects your whole body. And it's also particularly helpful for falling asleep since it's promoting that deep relaxation, but it's also occupying your mind with kind of an irregular counting cycle. So every, you'll hear me count, so it's an inhale to the count of four, a hold to the count of seven, and an exhale to the count of eight. We'll do it twice, and you just find a minute, close your eyes, sit up tall, you'll hear my cues, so just follow that count, and then we'll come back when we are finished. So inhale, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, inhale, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We'll bring it back together. Hopefully we are all a little bit um, more present and ready to um, be together. So resiliency is defined as a good outcome in the face of adversity. A resilient child has the capacity to steer through in any form of adverse event and learn from it and take away skills from it. So the, I love this little seesaw diagram because of course we're gonna have negative outcomes and of course we're gonna have positive outcomes, but this fulcrum is kind of the tools that we teach our children and represents kind of what we're doing and the strategies we're using as parents to help tip that balance closer towards the positive end. And resiliency is not, and it's not something you're born with, it's not inherent, it's a learned behavior. So it's definitely something we can teach our children. Certain personality types, certain characteristics that we all have might make it a little bit easier to be resilient, but it's not necessarily like there's resilient people and non-resilient people. So these are the strategies that researchers have pulled and that they see that resilient people are practicing on a regular basis. So bad outcomes are, are inevitable. 
resilient people have the mindset that that bad things happen they acknowledge it they accept it and then they are ready to move forward with it there is a difference between that acknowledgement and the suffering the 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 kind of the wallowing that sometimes happens and resilient people aren't seeking out the bad they're not focusing on the bad but they're just accepting bad things and negative experiences when they come their way resilient people also practice selective attention they know where to shift their focus. They're practicing gratitude. They seek out positives when they are faced with bad outcomes. They know that they cannot lose what they have to their negative experiences. So it's not ignoring the negative experiences, but instead turning towards the positive experiences that are happening or turning, turning towards the things that we have to be grateful for. Resilient people ask the question, is what I am doing helping or harming me. They're constantly evaluating their behaviors, thoughts, and actions for and looking at whether it's helping or harming. So one example I love is that I used to look at the coronavirus, num coronavirus numbers in Houston every day, and it made me really anxious, but I was doing it as a sense to make my family healthy, right? To, to have the level of risk in our head, but instead, I just had a lot of anxiety about the coronavirus, which made me grumpy and anxious and snapping at my children and snapping at my partner, when a healthier thing for my family would have been just to ignore the numbers and take it as they come, um, create a level of awareness, but not become absorbed by it. And I think that that's a really important lesson that we can talk to our children and more more specifically that we can model for our children and model for our families asking, you know, are these seven sports events, you know, pre-corona, are these seven sports events that we attend every week, is that helping or is that hurting my family? Being in that constant conversation um, is easier said than done, but it can be really beneficial when we're trying to build these resilient, um, build resilient children. The final thing that resilient people do are they can label their emotions and they have specificity about their emotions. So it's not just I'm feeling sad or I'm, I'm good today, I had a good day. It's getting specific about what each of those emotions mean. So I felt really joyful today or I'm feeling especially lonely today or I felt a lot of grief today because we didn't get to do what I wanted to do. So the more specific we can teach our children to be with their emotions, the better they can create their antidote for that emotion. So I know that I need something different when I'm experiencing grief, and I need something different when I'm experiencing loneliness. The, that differentiation feels small, but can be a really powerful tool when we're trying to equip our children with the correct coping skills and the correct, um, just what they need to, to, mo to move through life. And a lot of this research is based off of Dr. Lucy Hone. She's from New Zealand. She has a really great TED Talk um, and she has a really cool story that kind of goes along with all of this. So what tips the balance and what pushes that fulcrum tor closer towards the positive side, elevating the positive side for our children? And the two, two of the four things are coping skills and validating emotion. So coping skills are anything that we do to help us manage our feelings and to help us be more regulated in our feelings. So these are just four, there's, coping skills can really be kind of anything that you make. A lot of people talk about self-care, self-soothing. Um, it's all kind of under the same umbrella. These are four of my favorite coping skills. So progressive muscle relaxation is um, using our breath to relax our body in a very specific manner. So grouping our muscles together and tensing them on our inhale and releasing them on our exhale and moving, you know, kind of from head to toe. If you Google this, if you search it on YouTube, there'll be, there might be some guided meditations and there'll be a lot more specific instructions. But that's another great way to, that we connect our bodies and our brains so that we can learn to relax ourselves when we become dysregulated or when our children become dysregulated. This is a really easy one to teach like little bitty twos and threes as well, because there's lots of like, you can make big fists and scrunch your face and 
and blow out your breath really hard, um, those kind of those cues can help them learn a little bit more about their body and the way that it might be interacting with their, their emotions. Worry stones are kind of like any smooth rock or I, you could even get creative, an item, a piece of paper that you can run through your hands. You have nerves in your hands and when they're stimulated, um, they connect into your brain and that can release a calming effect um, on our bodies. And um, so you rub the, you know, you talk about the worry stone, they rub it, they rub it in their hands. The other side of the worry stone that's really cool is you can tell your worries to the stone and then the worries have left the child's body, they've left your body and they're in the stone and they're, they're safe there. Um, and you can kind of create a, a narrative around the stone. One of my favorite apps is the Calm app. It has guided meditations, breathing exercises, calming music. I'm pretty sure Matthew McConaughey gets on and tells like bedtime stories. So if you are struggling with this insomnia or your children is, some kids really like that kind of mono, not that Matthew McConaughey is monotone, but um, the, just the, the redundancy of a story that, can, that they can fall asleep to. Um, but there's lots of really cool, um, cool features on that app. And then accumulating positives. A lot of times when we become dysregulated or our children become dysregulated, we have the mindset and we go to sort of the catastrophe thinking of nothing good ever happens. Nothing good ever happens to me. This is particularly common in those like preteen, middle school age um, years or just that thinking. And so accumulating positive is a preventative for that and it can, it, it, we want to fill the bank, right? And whether we keep tabs of it, whether we keep notes, um, we want to fill that bank up for ourselves and for our children, so that we, ha when we do become dysregulated, we have things to draw, things to draw on. And so, if it's a list in your kitchen, if it's a journal they keep, if it's, um, you know, going around the dinner table and saying, saying their positive thing that day, and it requires. What I love about it is it's a really low bar. You know, parenting also sometimes feels super stressful and a lot of a lot of giving and it was really profound for me when I found this skill because it's just you do one pleasant thing a day which is pretty like low-key a lot of sometimes coping skills can feel really overwhelming like I don't know how to meditate on top of a mountain but you do know how to do one pleasant thing a day and keeping track of that so that when we do have those negative negative experiences we can draw we can draw on that knowledge validating emotions is is really important and i think that we don't typically parent as parents we don't do this enough because we're busy or we're trying to solve the pro we're trying to solve the problem so what this sounds like is sounds like you're having a difficult time with a friend it's repeating what you're hearing the child say to you or the partner or the coworker, whatever they're saying to you. And it's unearthing the emotion that you hear underneath or unearthing the struggle that you're hearing. Um, your emotions make a lot of sense to me. What I hear you saying is the teacher made you really angry. Angry. What I love about number two is that it, it leaves the door open for correction. So the child or the person could say, no, they're not making me really angry. They're making me really frustrated. I'm really frustrated by the teacher. You want to let the let whoever you're validating have that wiggle room in case you aren't right, because we don't like have a screen right of like I'm frustrated right now. We don't know when we're looking at a person their exact experience, and so we want to be really mindful of that. Parents, we always want to fix what they're what's happening, but oftentimes children just want to feel seen and heard and acknowledged with their experience. The other part that tips the balance is choice-centered language and moving from shame, shame thinking to guilt thinking or the shame mindset into the guilt mindset. The choice-centered language is making sure that we're focusing on the behavior and the choice to engage in that behavior rather than the child as a whole. Um, this will tie into the, the mindset of shame, but it's talking about the choices that you're making are okay. 
the choices you're making isn't okay. I loved the choices you were making with while you were playing with your brother. That was a really difficult decision. And I'm so proud of the choice you made. It's important to highlight that this goes both ways. So it's in positive interactions with our children and in negative interactions with our children. Because if we focus on the self and the positive, then it leaves the child open to interpret, well, if I didn't do that, then I must be a bad child. So we're constantly praising like, what a good girl you are, what a good boy you are, what a good athlete you are, whatever it is, it's, if I don't do those things, then I'm not a good girl, then I'm not a good boy. Um, so we wanna just, when we're talking to children, be really focused on the, the choice and, and, the, and the behavior. Shame. Shame is uncomfortable to talk about. It happens to everyone. It's a very distinct emotion. It has a lot, you know, when we, when we start to piece it out, especially in a therapeutic setting, people can tell you the exact feeling, like your hands start to sweat, your stomach hurts, you have a lump in your throat, your face gets really hot. Um, everyone knows it. It's an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. And it's something that we want to avoid. Shame is highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, eating disorders, suicide, all things that we don't want for our children. And this is because shame has a really high focus on ourself. And the message that shame tells is I am bad. I am a mistake. I am unworthy. Um, rather than that focus on behavior. And shame happens, we will shame our children. Our children will be shamed by teachers, adults. It's more about what our children, um, it's teaching our children to recognize the experience. So talking to them about their body and going back to that specificity of emotion. So when they do feel shamed by a teacher, they know that it's really important to reach out and talk to you and share how they're feeling and process their emotion at the same time. Guilt is a little bit different than shame. A lot of people get the differentiation wrong that we don't want people to feel guilty. We don't wanna guilt our children into anything, but we really do want them to cultivate a guilt mindset more than a shame mindset because guilt has a, has a distinction of, of reflection that shame, that shame does not. Um, and it's reflection on the choices and the actions that were taken rather than the self. So there's a, a strong focus on behavior and it's inversely correlated with all of those things that we don't want for our children, depression, violence, eating disorders. Um, and the language around guilt is that I made a bad choice. I made a bad decision. That was a mistake that I made rather than the message that I am a mistake or that I am a failure. It's I did fail a test. That is that's the distinct difference in in children who can cultivate more of this guilt mindset and parents that can can shift the focus and talk about things on a more choice-centered language are more resilient and can process those negative outcomes in a much um, in a much healthier manner. So moving forward, what do you want to do as a parent? We are, um, we're doing this through our own practice. So the biggest thing that we can do is we can model the behavior for our children. We can practice those three, those four strategies of resiliency. We're naming our emotions. We're asking, how is this helping or harming me? We're um, just accepting, accepting that challenging things come our way. And doing all of that can, it spills over onto our children, right? If we're constantly unable to name our emotions or do, engaging in behaviors that are harming us, we're not gonna be, that just gets passed on to, to what we are, to what our children are doing and absorbing. Um, and I think it's hard right now with COVID because parents are being asked to do like something we've never been done before. Parenting in a pandemic is really hard. We live with a lot of guilt of like, well, I can't put my children to bed because I'm on a Zoom call or I have to work. 
and I feel guilty about sending my children to school, uh, constantly questioning our, our decisions. And I think that we have to give ourselves an element of grace and cultivate that mindset of mindset of guilt of, of, and focus back to our choices, right? That, you know, I'm doing the best that I can right now. And knowing that I'm making these decisions moving forward, they might be a mistake, but it doesn't mean that I'm a bad parent. No one's ever parented in a pandemic before, except for the Spanish flu, I think. And that looks a whole lot different than 2020, right? And so giving ourselves kind of the permission and the balance of evaluating our choices and separating our choices from our inherent worth as a parent is really important to teach our children that they're not the choices that they make, even if they end up not proud of the choices that they make. And then just continuing, we're gonna validate their experiences, we're gonna lay and label their emotions so that they can start to tease out and just have overall um, better mental health and a better sense of self. Okay, thank you. Um, you are welcome to get in touch with me. That is my email. You can find me in carpool or at Holy Spirit in, in the mornings. Um, and if you want me to speak to your child, if you want me to reach out to your child, I'm more than happy to do so. You can do that just by emailing me or finding me on campus or talking to your child's teacher and I can, um, I can get in touch that way as well. I think what I wanted to mention, just this fits in so nicely with mindfulness and just having an awareness and helping your child be aware of separating um, choice. I mean, their choice versus, you know, who they are, but also their feelings. All of that is a big part of mindfulness. And we've been talking a lot about that at school in the classroom. Um, so I think that's really important. So um, just really good reminders. And definitely as parents practicing it ourselves, it is, you know, it's not easy. Um, but that the more we do it, the more we're then mindful and able to then pass that on to our, to our child. I think that's wonderful. Um, I just want to say we have the Calm app. And we have been using it with Braden at night. And there's a Thomas the Train meditation mindfulness exercise for kids. And it's four minutes long. But Braden loves to do that because it just says, you know, even though you've had a stressful day or what, name some things that you're thankful for. And so it's a cute little thing. It gets kids engaged, but it's not too long that it boards them and they go on to something else, but um, it's really been helpful. So I would highly recommend that to anybody. We'll say, I'm not sure what y'all are doing in class, but my four-year-old's coming home and saying, oh yeah, I, I'm pink today. I feel love. Like they're labeling emotions and they're putting it with colors. And last night he found a toy of his brother's that had different colors. And he's like, well, when I push this orange, you're going to be happy or sleepy. And when I push green, you're gonna be happy. And like, he would push it and want me to express those emotions. So it's not, it's something that y'all are doing. And it's been really interesting to watch. And I like him being able to put labels with emotions and the colors are helpful. That's wonderful. That's Meg, so thank great. you for showing, sharing that. Love that story. Well, Haley, that we really enjoyed the presentation. We're so grateful that you've joined us. And Haley's children attend Holy Spirit as well. She's a church member, so she she's all in in the Holy Spirit community. Wow. We like <laughs> drank the Kool Aid. You drank sure. the Kool Aid for sure. We're so glad you did. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, good. Well, it's great to see everybody again. Things are going really well at school, and I I want to thank all of you for your um, cooperation and and help as we navigate these really unusual times with COVID. Um, things are going very, very well. We, uh, and I knock on wood every time I say it, but we've not had any cases um, so far. And we've just finished a trimester. 
Um, so that's wonderful. And I think part of that's the protocols and part of that is just the fact that our community is just so wonderful and cooperating with us and letting us know when their child's sick or things are happening. I and mean, it helps us really be on top of things. So I just thank all of you for that. It's just going really, really well. Um, and then today, just so you'll know, we had a um, outdoor open house. And I see Jen's on with us. She's our admissions director. Um, but oh my goodness, it was fantastic. We had um, 30 families attend and um, a few folks that uh, joined us uh, this year new who didn't get to tour because of COVID. And so during that March through uh, May, when we weren't having visitors on campus, um, we got to know our some new families through Zoom, but they had not been on campus yet. So, um, so we had uh, some families uh, join us for that as well. But it was such a, a lovely morning. Um, the weather was beautiful, and we have such a beautiful campus with the gorgeous trees, and it just everything looked beautiful. We had artwork out um, and and classwork for the families to see. And then the tour was totally outside since we have a no visitor policy and can't go inside. Um, it was totally outside and we did temperature checks and screenings and all of that. And then toured um, going through the um, outdoor corridor and out to the uh, primary playground and field and garden area. And they got to see um, PE and recess. And we had a class doing a science experiment, just all kinds of fun things going on. And then we did some peeking in the windows um, <laughs> in the classrooms. And so that was a really good way to keep everyone safe, yet to be able to um, see kids in action. And it was just such a great success. So we'll be doing some more of those outdoor tours. Uh, well, we appreciate you all joining us on this uh, wonderful evening and hope to uh, see you again, uh, either through Zoom or maybe in person at a Christmas coffee. <laughs> so thanks again. And Kimberly, thank you for leading us through PTO. And uh, thank you again, Haley, for your wonderful presentation. And again, good to see you all. You all have a wonderful evening.